Thank you. Thank you for having me, as I said. So um, as the title of this has changed, which I think is always speaker's prerogative as our research develops, we, we, we nuance our titles. Um, and the title for this talk is hashtag remember together we are one. Um, Holocaust and World War II commemoration during 2020, during the 2020 COVID-19 lockdown. I'm going to mo mostly focus on, on, on Holocaust commemorations here, but touching a little bit on um, Remembrance Sunday. Um, as a as a form of connectivity, particularly bringing people together during um, commemorations where people had to be separated in the last year. Um, but this particular hashtag, it was also used for the UK Yom HaShoah events, although despite being the kind of official hashtag and the kind of slogan as such for the event, was not as well used as ones for the event. Um, so it kind of relates to both the specifics and the, the, the generality of this, this talk. So I've been writing about digital Holocaust memory, as Oliver introduced, for some time. Um, but the restrictions imposed on all of us by COVID-19 raised both difficult and interesting questions in relation to this topic. Um, difficult for those planning and coordinating what would have been huge in-person gatherings to mark the 75th anniversaries of the liberation of the last Nazi concentration camps and the end of World War II. But interesting for those like me, researchers who, who weren't having to suddenly make um, all of these decisions um, for studying this phenomenon and also for the entire kind of heritage sector as well. The shift to online commemorations had sparked conversations about a hybrid future for events. Um, and a lot of the organisations that I, I work closely with and, and communicate with quite regularly hadn't really thought about the idea of there being an online element to events, commemoration events, um, are very much about going to a particular site, having particular people there, doing particular things in person. And now, you know, this idea of hybrid commemoration events is, is the kind of buzzword that everyone's talking about in the same way that we're talking about this in the classroom as well. And lots of these museums um, and, and memory sites and organisations do use digital and have used digital tools, but there's a there's a substantial tension within um, Holocaust memory, particularly um, around how open and how participatory you make these practices. How much you let go of the kind of the gatekeeping of not only the historical narrative but of the ethics of memory practice as well. And I've been having conversations with with several professionals organising commemorations who have been particularly kind of pleasantly surprised and um, about some of the unexpected things that have come out of the pandemic. So some of the oldest Holocaust survivors in their late 90s have been incredibly enthusiastic about um, li live streams on Facebook, WhatsApp, um, Zoom calls, and I mean pushing museums to get them online more. Um, and they were more worried about these individuals not being kind of digital, digitally savvy. And actually, at the other end, it's been young people not wanting to turn their microphones and cameras on when talking to survivors. That has been the, the problem. The kind of you know, people like to talk about the digital natives, the younger generation, which is a you know, problematic term that anyone in media studies will recognise. Um, but it's quite interesting to see that it was the older generation who were you know, really wanted to engage with this technology. Beyond the, the Holocaust context, I've been talking to some people who are um, involved in the 25th anniversary of Srebrenica, the Bosnian genocide. Um, and they were seeing that survivors were really fascinated in, in that context, that they didn't have to constantly recite their testimony, that maybe this, said, this, this kind of format online suggested that they could record their testimony and that would be satisfactory that it was okay just to listen to recorded testimony, which means, you know, we're talking about people who are in their 30s and 40s who are trying to rebuild um, a sense of kind of normality in their lives and would prefer not to regularly revisit their traumatic past. We've also, um, you know, with some of the con concentration camp memorial sites, been talking about the benefits and challenges of platforms like TikTok. Um, Iris Groshek, who I'll talk about later at New and Gammon, has been talking about whether they should get a TikTok account, um, which I think is a fantastic and fascinating conversation. Um, we've also talked about Twitter and Instagram for creating the sense of liveness and togetherness. And I've been contemplating how important geographical sites might continue to be for the future of commemorative, commemoration events. And next Wednesday is International Holocaust Memorial Day, um, which usually mark or does mark the um, liberation of Auschwitz particularly. Um, it has become a kind of um, an event that encapsulates the com commemoration of all genocides now. 
Um, but of course, you know, with Auschwitz there being the site, the important site, um, and and the yeah, every year there are um, commemorations at Auschwitz. These will be online for the first time this year because last year they were one of the few events um, to be able to happen still in person. Um, <clears throat> So it's quite a controversial thing to start asking. Are these really important historical sites, these sites that kind of trade in authenticity, they present the material evidence that encourages people to continue to you know, believe um, and, and it, see the significance of memory um, of genocides? You know, do, they, do these sites need to be at the, at the core of commemoration events? Can something happen that's different in the digital? And COVID has, you know, introduce these kind of unexpected questions, these things that were taken for granted before can now be you know, potentially up for debate. Okay, so I mean, one of the things that also comes out of this, and I'll talk through this with some of the examples, is that not all sites closed for their commemorations. And the example on the screen there is Bergen Belsen, which I'll, I'll come back to in detail later. Um, they just closed to the public. So there are questions there about who has access to sites, who has the right to have access to these sites, when they are closed, who are they closed to? So I thought I'd start by just kind of talking about how some of this has emerged and then I'm going to end the talk by talking about where this project is going. So this, the research I'm going to talk about today is very much the kind of beginnings of the theoretical underpinnings for a much larger um, practice project um, really that I'm working with some partners both academic and um, heritage professionals. So Oliver mentioned the blog, digitalholocaustmemory.com. Um, I started this last April. Um, it, it really started as a space to collect my ideas, so the things I was analysing, the kind of ephemeral digital content that's not always easy to capture as it's changing regularly, and actually just talking about things as they appeared and the controversies at the Holocaust Challenge on TikTok this summer and the Hunter's Amazon series, talking about the, mo yes, the moment they arise and, and, and logging those um, thoughts. But it became more of a community project in that um, I was shielding, um, obviously lots of colleagues around the world who were working in Holocaust um, memory were getting in contact with me. And I thought that some of the conversations we were having just felt like they could be more public um, and that that would be helpful, that lots of different organizations could be talking to each other. Um, so. It, continued as a blog and I know one person here, Kate Marison, who's um, contributed to both the blog and online discussions is here and Kate's work is, is brilliant. Um, and it, these, it emerges both the blog and then these online discussion forums that were happening kind of roughly every month with, with breaks for, for summer and the holidays. Um, and also now a Discord server to talk about um, the Holocaust and computer games. And it was through this site that I started reflecting on some of the commemorations that were happening last year. And increasingly, my work hasn't really been about commemoration events. It's been about media texts as such, websites, um, VR, um, pla different platforms and social media, et cetera. But I became really fascinated in these events. And they, you know, there were so many of them going online because of the 75th um, anniversary. And so I started reflecting um, in the blog. And the first thing that was coming to mind was the kind of relationship between I mean, the digital and, and, and the material and how these events were shifting between being very much on the screen and, and engaging with people in the home at the same time. So <clears throat> some of the issues I started to think about here, and these are just some snippets of elements of the blog post that I was talking about um, with this back, this is back kind of last April now, April, May. Um, was the relationship between the, the material physical world and the appearance of digital immateriality. And that's a word that the digital is very much material, um, <clears throat> but it often feels like it's, it, it's not in comparison to the things, tangible things we can touch in our immediate environment. Um, issues around distance and closeness. Um, the idea of networking and connectivity, you know, commemoration is about remembering together or remembrance together. It's that communal remembrance. Um, and spaces like Zoom and social media platforms, you know, they're kind of reason for existence is to connect people as well. And I was also interested in how or could we archive digital commemorative events? Do these become texts that we can now collect and archive and study? Could you archive an in-person event? Um, 
and I talk about this at the, the end of the presentation, what some of the ruminations that uh, have come from these thoughts. So fundamentally, I was trying to see if online commemoration events are simply continuations of in-person ones, or if commemoration becomes something else when it goes online. And I'm particularly thinking about commemorative events here. Um, so, so some of the conversations that, that kind of sprung out of this uh, here, um, conversations with people at um, sites, the, the main talk that related to this was about Holocaust memory between digital and physical spaces. We also did, talked a lot about archives and how archives are kind of reaching out and trying to be a bit more connective. The problems museums were facing um, immediately in the pandemic, so that was in around May, June time. And then we've been talking a lot about computer games and the potential for computer games to become spaces of memory practice. So to really focus in then on some of the kind of the case studies that I've been looking at and, and, and to introduce this. So the first question then is kind of what is commemoration? And, and to start off with, I think it's very easy to get kind of wrapped up in, in the materiality of commemorations, the things that we see, um, you know, the regalia, such as flags and uniforms, the commemorative items, the symbols, the reefs, the candles, the, the flowers, the stones, the people together the mass of people and with that who's invited and who's not who becomes part of a particular memory community um, and quite often you know the difference between the kind of official um, dignitaries and the crowd of participants and how they're distinguished as groups of invitees and the kind of hierarchy um, that they're given and often a specific geographical place which often has a physical memorial or monument such as the uh, cenotaph in London um, or which a community is campaigning for one to be built which does happen sometimes at contested sites and sometimes the site might have less historical or cultural significance but accommodates a large group of people so somewhere like a town hall a stadium um, it doesn't necessarily yeah you know, if you want to try and you need to have a big crowd it's perhaps better to have these these communal spaces but again they, they still have that um, symbolism of being a, a kind of a public space or a space to be, be to come together as a crowd, even if they don't have the historical significance. But I really wasn't satisfied with this kind of definition of, of commemoration, because if we go with this, in many cases, any online commemoration just fails to be a commemoration event because it can't do a lot of these things. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily, you know, that's a justifiable answer. It feels far too easy. So I was... <laughs> going back deep into the, the histories of the annals of philosophy um, and thinking about kind of Aristotelian idea of form. Um, and I'll share with you two really elegant examples that he uses to, to kind of distinguish form from, from the material. So the first one was, um, if calm is defined as flat C, then C is the matter and flatness is the form. If no breeze is defined as the absence of motion in a large volume of air, then air is the matter, but stillness is the form. So we might think of form as that as which gives shape to the matter um, in the instance. Um, and in the context of commemorative events, to me, that's what imbues all this material stuff with the commemorative function. What makes this work as commemorative stuff when it comes together? So a candle could just be in your living room. Uh, mood lighting, a stone could just be on the beach. But when we put these things together um, into a commemorative event, there's a different form that's going on that unites all of this together. So <clears throat> through looking at all of the, uh, a substantial amount of the literature in, on, on commemorations, but also looking at commemorative events, it strikes me that there's kind of three core things that define the form or the essence of commemorations. And it's quite simply sacred repeated activity. And I use the concept sacredness here in a really broad sense. And this is following Durkheim's work on, um, on, on religion and the religio religiosity. Um, and for him, the religiosity could be found in the sacred and the profound, um, you know, in the everyday events of life, as well as, as the more kind of structured, sacred, religious sense. Um, and I, so I'm using sacred here in this kind of whether it, it, it can actually, it doesn't have to be religion or faith with a capital R or a capital F. And it's the important thing about it is that it defines and binds a group's identity over time. And there's no surprise that in Durkheim's writing on religious life and ritual, um, 
went on to inspire people like Halvach and others to write about collective memory. He really, he was the predecessor of memory studies. Um, and this idea of the sacredness and religion in his writing are, are really key to that writing that comes up later about remembering together. And to use his words here, he says that um, it's the coming together and one it's the coming together and one which creates common feelings which are re-experienced and expressed by communal acts which create an exceptional powerful stimulant. And that powerful stimulant to me, you know, we could also describe it as, as an effective intensity. So really what I mean by sacred here is, is an, it's a communal intensity of affect. Commemorative events must also be based on repetition. Renowned German memory scholar Elida Asman reminds us that it's this repetition that re-embodies, reactivates and reanimates the past. And I quote her, there were those three words starting with R. And that this provides the temporal continuity that constitutes remembering. Memory requires movement across the temporal planes of past, present and future. Nevertheless, in his phenomenological study of remembering, Edward Casey argues that whilst the formalities of any ceremony are repeated and need to be, they are repeated because the original event, event cannot or should not be. Therefore, they act as symbols, substitutes for a lack that can never be overcome. World War I, the Holocaust, World War II, we do not, we do not want these events to be repeated. We, we hear the idiom never again as part of the process, but the actual ceremonies are then, then repeat in order to draw attention to the absence, the trauma, the lack. Commemorations are not passive events either. And indeed, we can never think of any event as simply happening to or at people. But Paul Connaughton, Asman, Kosu and Cassie uh, have all emphasised the significance of the embodied and linguistic markers that enable participation in events. From simply a compare signifying the collective as a we, we are here together, enfolding the audience you know, into the same community as them, to synchronous activity performed by an entire, entire gathered memory community, such as the lighting of candles. So in establishing the form of commemoration as sac sacred repeated activity, I then posed myself seven questions, which I, I used to frame an analysis of online commemoration events, to try and see if this kind of idea of sacred repeated activity was still there in these events, or if something changed. So these are the questions. I post. Um, how did they construct a specific memory community? So the idea of, of, of yeah, a communal intensity needs a community, a, a group of people for it to exist. How do they create a sense of togetherness then? And how do they invoke the intensity? To what extent do they continue actions from previous in-person ceremonies? To what extent do online commemoration events foreground embodiment? And how do participants perform bodily action during these events and how is that presented? And then to what extent are these activities repetition of those previous events? So <clears throat> my I'm going to talk about two examples. The first is the UK Yom HaShoah service, um, and the other is the um, 75th anniversary of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. <clears throat> so the English translation of the full name um, of Yom HaShoah um, means Holocaust and Heroism Remembrance Day. It's commemorated in Israel as part of a series of national memorial events, but it's also marked by the international Jewish diaspora. So whilst there is International Holocaust Memorial Day on the 27th of January, which marks the liberation of Auschwitz, and keeps the image of the, the kind of weak, passive Jewish camp victim in the imaginary, um, as we're used to from the liberation pictures, Holocaust and Heroism Remembrance Day focuses on the image of the Jewish resistors, particularly remembering the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Although seemingly paradoxically to this aim, the UK 2020 online event also marked the 75 years since the liberation of Bergen-Belsen, which is significant because this event is the UK Yom HaShoah service. So it's, yeah, Bergen-Belsen is a very significant event in British memory of the Holocaust, and the anniversary fell only five days before Yom HaShoah. So this event establishes its memory community to be British Jews primarily, but spoke out to the wider international Jewish diaspora and also linked both to Israel. Repeatedly, the master of ceremony, Henry Grunwell and other speakers referred to Yom HaShoah, and I, I quote him here, 
as our day to mark our personal and communal loss, while recognising the welcome, um, welcoming the presence of special friends from outside our community. And he um, specifically acknowledges um, His Royal Highness Prince Charles as one of those special friends. Um, so making a kind of nod to our non-Jewish British friends who we are invited to attend our ceremony and also welcomes the international Jewish community at one point um, but while recognising a very specific British um, primary audience in this memory community. The Mag and David, Star of David, features prominently in the Holding Pages logo and on the banner at the bottom of the live stream screen. The image of the remembrance candle is central, uh, centred in front of it. And you can see that just at the, the bottom of the screen picture there. <coughs> The live stream ceremony broadcast last April included a number of elements that were repeated rituals, either for specifically from previous Yom HaShoah events or from general within Holocaust um, memorialization. These include young people making a memory pledge for the future, the singing of the Haktivka, the hope, and the British national anthem. There is also a performance of the Yiddish partisan, partisan song, um, Zog Nit Kien Mo, originally penned in the Vilna Ghetto in 1943, which was inspired by the news of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. The Holocaust Memorial Prayer follows this and a reading of a Kaddish. Although the speaker notes that we don't usually say Kaddish without a minyan, 10 Jewish men, but he recognises the significance here to break with a material physical tradition as the significance of the Kaddish from the Holocaust memory far outweighs it. And this is quite interesting where uh, in this uh, case, there were not 10 men with him in his physical space, but there were certainly more than 10 men on the, the collaborative broadcast and certainly within the audience. So it goes back to this, this issue I raised in my, my first comment, where is here, uh, where is there, what does it mean to be together for these rituals and, the, and how do we spatialize that? <clears throat> The event's narrative presents a transgenerational community, including school choirs, the teenage pledges, Holocaust survivors and their children, as well as Jewish celebrities who participate in telling the history stories of the kinder transportees, the boys, and Bergen Belsen. And these are key narratives um, that have little to do with the Warsaw Ghetto uprising and far more to do with British memory of the Holocaust. So again, this is linking of the, the wider idea of Yom HaShoah to the British Jewish identity. Notably absent are narratives of British internment camps for German Jews and any mention of Bürbassen, a detainment camp under British colonial rule um, in Mauritius. British non-Jews here are celebrated as heroes, as rescuers and liberators. A particularly moving movement in the ceremony is pictured on screen. A series of six survivors light candles. Each candle delivered to them as part of the Yellow Candle Project contains a card with the name and details of a Holocaust victim. In this case, it is the survivor's own relatives, and we watch them in sequence as their images fill the screen. Then we see all six in split screen. We then see all of the official contributors in multiple screens, as you can see on my screen here. Fort Grinswald welcomes participants at home to do the same with a the candle they have received. So these candles and cards have been posted out to um, various people who then light their candles. But they do, and many share their candle lighting on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag yellow candles. These are retweeted in the live Twitter feed next to the event's live screen, which is curated here. So it's not, um, you can create these embedded um, Twitter feeds based on a hashtag if you want, but they've gone for just the official account and so that they can then retweet people's contributions and post it here. And I'll just show you some of the tweets there. <coughs> so the people at home. Um, follow the, the, the remembrance pledges of the people represented to them in the Zoom call um, by um, often doing exactly what you see here in Victoria Dad's um, tweet. We light these candles to remember three children who died in the Holocaust. And then they name the children um, and where they died, which, are, what, which is what is presented on the, the, the cards there. So they perform the memory ple pledge back at everyone else. And it becomes this um, moment of intensity where if you, you know, do hashtag yellow candle into Twitter, um, you suddenly get this kind of moment where loads of candles, uh, lit candles are suddenly on your screen. 
And so very much like similar in-person events, a communal intensity is evoked here through the synchronous and embodied participation of attendants, attendees lighting their candles and sharing this lighting with each other on social media. Not only are they lighting the candles, they're then um, you know, picking up their phones, taking the pictures and uploading on Twitter. This is several le uh, levels of participation that are both about mediating your experience and having the experience and sharing in the experience. <clears throat> now, knowing others are doing the same action at the same time, regardless of geographical distance, reminds us of Benedict Anderson's work on the imagined community. One of the examples he writes about in his book is about someone reading a newspaper for bre at breakfast time, which was you know, quite standard once upon a time. Um, and you know, wherever you were in say, the British Empire, you would be reading your newspaper at breakfast time when someone else would be doing it at breakfast time. It might not be the exact same time, but you had a feeling that other people were reading the same news. You felt part of a community, even if you couldn't see them. Yet here, this community is not just imagined. The community is simultaneously represented back at the participants through the multiple screens on Zoom. So while we don't just see one person lighting their candle, we see all of the kind of official participants come up in multiple screens and also through the Twitter feed. So we go from a single survivor to six to multiple screens and then to the wider community field after uh, further afield. <coughs> So the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen is a very different event, although also marked as part of um, Yom HaShoah in the UK. So UK Yom HaShoah events usually take place in a large space such as a stadium. The specificities of the site are, are largely unimportant. It needs to accommodate a big crowd of people. Now, there were numerous concentration camp liberations between 1944 and 45, but the distinction of the Bergen-Belsen event from many others is Bergen-Belsen, is a specific geographical site. The in-person ceremony had planned to host 5,000 guests at the memorial site at Bergen-Belsen. And the online commemoration still has a site-based element, but the ritualistic activity of dignitaries and staff laying wreaths was broadcast out to the international community. And you can see here that they put the images on Twitter. Um, and you can see the... Uh, um, a good following of social distancing rules, um, <laughs> carefully framed as well to make sure that it wasn't confused or you know, misinterpreted as being too close together. <coughs> and whilst the Yom HaShoah event required younger generations to pledge to remember their cultural ancestors, survivors or victims of the Holocaust, the liberation event here spoke of we, German people, and particularly German dignitaries, who pledged to remember for you the people of different cultures, religions, and nations that are hurt and minorities within their own culture. And I think this was really interesting. It came uh, across in various different aspects of it is, is the use of pronouns. That whatever, whether we're online or offline, pronouns can be quite powerful in constructing a memory community and defining the boundaries. And who might be here as an observer? So we have show a French child, he's welcome to give his um, speech, but he's not part of the memory community. Here, the memory community was specifically um, German. And there's a huge amount of writing about um, the kind of memory culture um, in Germany. And anyone who's been to the center of Berlin will be aware of the increasing number of memorials related to World War II and the Holocaust that are being built there. So <clears throat> the commemoration event, and um, this is, I think, an interesting question, is what then constitutes event when we go online, um, exists in three forms for Bergen-Belsen. So the first is um, sorry, sorry, um, is the NDR live televised broadcast from which these images here are taken from. Um, it included some pre-recorded clips, but it were it specifically broadcast the reflaying um, live, and that was on the fifteenth of April. And the broadcast ends with the hashtag #BergenBowsen75. There was in the website. Um, <clears throat> which is www.flyalong75.de. Um, interestingly, I tried to get some better shots of the site just a couple of days ago, and all the videos have gone off YouTube. So I'm wondering whether this is prep for this year or if something's um, happened, um, something worth investigating. Um, so if you want to try and visit the site, you might find that the content isn't there at the moment. But this site was mostly constructed of small video clips. So you can just see the top of one there, the Bergen Bells and the end and the beginning. The top of the page were 
um, speeches of people who would have spoken had it been happening in person. Um, and representatives included a, an academic expert on totalitarianism, um, a survivor, and representatives of Jewish and Roma and Sinti communities. It also includes the full NDR broadcast translated into multiple languages and clips of young German um, school children performing solo versions of the traditional lights on the track ceremony. And in this, there's usually a candle lighting um, by the, the railway cart that's uh, at Bergen-Belsen and they repeat the words of survivors. Um, and then at the end of the page, there's usually the video of summer school participants who offer their reflection on memory culture. And there is an element of contribution here. So the bit I did capture um, in the photograph here is the digital guestbook where you can leave a message. And currently it has received messages from people in France, Germany, Poland, the Netherlands, Israel and Australia. The summer school um, video at the end has a hashtag BB and me, which unfortunately, if you look at it up on Twitter, has not particularly taken as a Bergen-Belsen memorial. Um, it seems to be related to people's pets. So it's people hugging, you know, big Dalmatian dogs and rabbits and all kinds of <laughs> totally unrelated to the Holocaust thing. So there's a lesson in um, being careful about hashtags. But you also don't know the future. Like you may well have search BB and me as a hashtag and see it's never been used. But that doesn't mean it won't be appropriated for a different context later. I think the most interesting part of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen um, as a kind of commemorative event this year is the way that it persists as part of a wider educational campaign, which was led by um, Iris Groshek, who's head of education at Neuengamon Concentration Camp Memorial, and probably one of the most like, inspired to think digitally about Holocaust memory people in Europe at the moment, I think. Um, she, it was her that was talking about, you know, should we have TikTok? Should we take this platform seriously? Um, she used hashtags and a curated Twitter account to bring together authorised or official commemorative activities related to um, 75 liberation in English or 75 Befreiung in German. Um, and what was quite fascinating and quite powerful about this campaign was that what was once a network of camps where horrific violence was performed now became a memory network of sites and organisations commemorating victims and survivors. And the, the account um, you can follow through and it's kind of you know it's a curated lists of all these different commemorative events that were happening for the 75th anniversary. <clears throat> this project was not created because of COVID, and this is where Iris is just always <laughs> ahead of her time with things. Um, well, was every other organisation was kind of um, in shock in March that you know these you know and coming to coming around to the reality that these huge events and really important events. Um, because they are quite possibly the last major commemoration that survivors will be able to attend, um, couldn't go ahead. And how to go online with this, how to deal with this. Um, 75 Before Wrong started in January. Iris launched this um, with um, International Holocaust Memorial Day. So she was, this was not because of COVID, um, but actually became incredibly useful be because of um, the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> So when we look at the kind of Bergen-Belsen commemorations as a, as a whole, and it's part in a, in a bigger network as well. We see on one hand that the physical repetition of the reflaying and the lights on the track rituals that continue to happen in person here. They don't try and replicate them in a digital way. They just record them uh, interestingly on television and then put that online. These resisted any possibility of both the form and material signifiers of the commemoration being altered for the 2020 events, despite the restrictions of the pandemic. And I think this was very interesting to see in London um, with Remembrance Day, which, if I recall rightly, was actually during our, our second lockdown. They've all blurred into <laughs> to one in my imagination now. Um, and we still had a substantial number of people laying reefs um, in London. And that was broadcast on, on the BBC. So we have a similar uh, parallel happening here. And with the Bergen Belsen case, perhaps this is illustrative of quite how important the sense of duty to remember is in the nation um, where the Holocaust was planned and managed and whose people voted for Adolf Hitler to come to power. And many of whom went on to become explicit perpetrators or at least complicit in genocide or bystanders. On the other hand, by hosting these small scale ceremonies, the communal intensity of the moment was diminished as a reporting journalist referred to the audience at home as you. 
and used terms like viewers and broadcast, which emphasised the distance between those of us who watched and those that participated. And some of the speakers referred to um, the people there as we. And there was this differentiation between we who have been given the right to access the memorial site and you who must be, be distant for this event. Yet the sense of communal intensity perhaps is not entirely lost. The use of hashtags and particularly the integration of the Bells and event into the wider network project of, of 75B Fryong dispersed this intensity across not only space but time. So as I said, the project ran from January, it ran through to May, and it kept sites like Belsen, Sachsenhausen, Neuengam and Dachau, Ravensbrück and other memorial sites across Germany visible in the public space and, and, and the, in the imaginary and prominent in public consciousness for a far longer period than a momentary event held at a particular site on a specific day. Uh, this perhaps suggests that the network logics of the web, of web 2.0 might offer new possibilities for commemorative form. I halt the sacredness, repeatedness of the activity. I don't think so. However, I think it certainly reconceptualized the idea of communal intensity. Rather than having this come to you know, appear in culminative moments at specific geographical sites, as um, does happen in the Yom Hashoah candle lighting. 75 Befreiung illustrates that communal effect could be spread across time and space in ways that encourage intensity through their long longevity and their spreadability. So that's the kind of theoretical underpinnings um, of some of the work I'm, I'm focusing on now. And I thought I would just end by talking about the project that this has inspired. So it was thinking about these issues around site, intensity, community, and really togetherness, which I think seems so important in every context that we're working in under, under COVID. Um, how are they, you know, what's the future of, of commemorations? Um, and I started working with some colleagues in the text analysis group um, at Sussex in the Sussex Humanities Lab and um, Tobias Eber Cartman also at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem to think about the question of whether you can archive commemoration events. And part of this stems from the fact that um, that there's a huge, huge, ever expanding amount of work in memory studies. It is a interdisciplinary field of fields of fields that <laughs> never ending. But within that, there's not a huge amount on commemoration events, and the word commemoration often kind of just gets used interchangeably for for quite solo memorialization experiences. The communal, the co bit of commemoration seems to to dissipate in lots of that writing, and that's because commemoration events are difficult to study. Some people do kind of um, self-ethnographic work where they go into the crowd and they talk about their experience. But to capture the entire crowd's experience, to capture every element of, a, of an event as it happens is really difficult. And as a researcher, if you were trying to say next week, capture how every single International Holocaust Remembrance Day event happened, you would need an incredibly large research team who all had a kind of group think ability to compare those events. Um, so they are difficult material. When they go online, they're recorded. Yeah, as Oliver's recording this event today, you know, people obsessively record. You know, I've, I've put events online, and within minutes, someone says, "Where's the recording? Where's the recording going up?" People love the recordings, and this is great. We have this stuff. Um, one of our, our partners on the project is the uh, United States. Um, no, no, wrong, wrong person. <laughs> USC Shoah Foundation. Sorry, um, and they've been looking at, you know, whether they can create an archive of. Uh, video recordings of the March of the Living. Now, these are of the actual in-person events and um, people um, video recording, video recording the crowd. Um, but, you know, this, again, it's still snippets of information. Um, but then I thought, you know, when we look at these recordings, you lose something. When you, if you watch the Yom HaShoah recording, just, you know, on, or, or similar ones on YouTube, you don't have that live Twitter feed. When that live Twitter feed came up during that event, I went straight onto Twitter. I was like, I'm not satisfied with the live Twitter feed. I want to see the hashtag more widely. And there seems to be you know, this sense that we can capture what I like to call the whispers in the crowd. You know, when we're at commemoration events, you know, often you're told to be very silent, um, but people will be talking and whispering and sharing their own experiences, either before the event, after it, or even during it. I'm often being told to shh as they do. Um, and on Twitter and on other social media platforms, that stuff's recorded. People shared. People used these hashtags. Um, 
And so that's what we've been interested in, that the archive isn't just of the kind of official orders of ceremonies, but is of, of the wider conversations that, that are kind of tagged into that through, through hashtags. And then, you know, this, this raises lots of questions for us. So um, it raises the question of what is the commemorative event? And this is something we've been working with, with partners is, um, remember in Srebrenica is one of our partners, we're looking at the 25th anniversary um, of the Bosnian genocide with that. Um, they created a kind of crowdsource museum, virtual museum space. So they called out on Twitter for people to share material and put it into a space. Does that count as a commemorative event? It's still got this kind of communal intensity going on about it. Um, does the um, 75 Bifrayuang um, account and hashtag count as an event or are we going too far out? Is it just things that look like what we call events in, in, in person and non-COVID times? Are they the only things that are events? Um, and then it also raises kind of questions about what an archive is. And these are questions that, you know, anyone who's read Wolfgang Ernst or other people writing up a digital memory will be familiar with. You know, how can we archive dynamic digital events that happen across multiple spaces and across time? Um, is there a collection, is, is such a collection still an archive or does it become something else? Um, and what are the things that constitute our archival objects or our assets in this project? It's certainly something when we've been having conversations, we're, we're set, you know, we keep flitting between the language of assets and data and objects and events and we're never quite sure which one's which <laughs> or where one ends and the next begins. And also how can this, you know, how can we actually present any of this information in ways that might help organisations planning for future hybrid flexi, Zoom flexi events. Um, and also academics interested in studying commemorations. If we get all this information together, what, how might it help us understand more about commemoration events, particularly how people participate in them? So the partners we're working on with this are the South Africa Genocide and Holocaust Foundation, the Bubassin Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center in Mauritius, Bergen-Belsen and Neuengamme Concentration Camp Memorials and the Remembering Srebrenica. We're hoping to, to bring a, a Rwandan diaspora element into this as well. We're, we're working on um, you know, building that network of, of connections at the moment. And we wanted this to not just be about the Holocaust and World War II, but that was our starting point because it was such a major anniversary um, last year. Um, but it, you know, one of the things some of our partners have said is that, you know, when you do events and they ask for feedback from you know the audience they ask almost immediately and people are like oh it's really powerful it was moving and then they ask them six months later and they can hardly remember the event and they what they you know there's their kind of a they need this good impact data for funding like everyone does but also it's that question as educators and memory um you know stakeholders that you know, we want people to remember these things for a long time if after six months they can barely remember the events was the, was the event really serving its purpose um, and that's where this idea of, of spreading intensity across time that intensity may be something more spreadable than being about a particular moment to me that's where that's particularly interesting I think when we're thinking about the potential for the role of the digital in in commemoration events going forward I will stop there and leave the floor um, for questions Thank you, Vicky. That, that's 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 fabulous. There's so I have so many questions um, here. Um, I'll perhaps uh, before we turn to to everyone, I'll perhaps start off with a question. Um, and I think perhaps the easiest way uh, is if you can di virtually put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. That gives me a kind of little list, kind of order of people, and then I'll I'll, I'll move to you. And 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 then if you want to turn on your video and and, and ask the the question uh, to Vicky, that that would be. That would be fabulous. So if you've got a question, please, please put up your hand um, and and I'm sure Vicky uh, will be will be very happy to, to respond to that. Um, I thought perhaps just um, immediately, just a thought right at the end there about what you were saying. I, I was kind of intrigued by this, uh, the way you were talking about the, the sort of disappointment of uh, I can't remember exactly which event you were talking about, but the, the disappointment of the organisers that six months later people didn't remember the event. And, and I was kind of intrigued because before you talked about this kind of what what exactly is the event? Do, are we talking about a memory of a memory of them? And, and I was as that that difference between are we trying to remember the original event? Yeah, sort of, Derrida would hate this, but, you know, kind of original <laughs> event. Or are we trying to remember the commemoration of the event or what exactly is happening there? And particularly with this 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 question of archiving. Once you start archiving 
the commemoration, what what is the interaction there between the say in this case the end of the Second World War or the liberation of the of the concentration camp and then the repeated commemorations and what exactly are we remembering? Perhaps yeah, if you could speak I, to that, that'd be great. Absolutely, and I think when I read Casey's you know, comment about this kind of the, the, the repetition to replace the lack or kind of stand in for the lack, I think what really strikes me with commemorations is you know how much of the, the content is, is symbolic and how much of it is actually really still linked to the uh, the reality of that historical event. Um, and now the Yom HaShoah's um, service had um, archive footage, which I think was really, some of the performances were through archive mm. footage. Um, so they had to, the first time you hear it in, in that ceremony, it is um, the liberation footage at Bergen-Belsen and the people there singing it. Um, but we also have... Um, Sorry, I get distracted by the waiting in the lobby side on the screen. <laughs> um, you also have these fragments where people are, are, are telling you historical narratives, and that becomes very important. And and the histor the history in that event is linked back to what one of the speakers calls the first Holocaust, which which they're referring to is the um, the exile from um, from Egypt. Um, so there is this kind of narrative history built into that event, kind of an educational element. That's not always true. I mean, you know often um, Remembrance Sunday events are very much about symbolism, for example, the flags, the wreaths, the poppy, and the controversies about the different colours of poppies that we have. <laughs> you know, there's so many different poppies now. Um, so, yeah, and I think this is perhaps something now that, now that you know, hopefully this archival project, if it works, hopefully it will do something useful. Um, one of the things I you know, hope we can do is actually get organisations to look at what they do. They don't, they don't watch what they do. They get feedback from audiences and, and compile that for funding grants, but they never really have been able to rewatch their own ceremonies and to think about these questions about what commemorations are. So part of that project is to do a kind of iterative design process with our partners, but also wider people in the heritage sector, memory um, organisations and academics to actually look at the data we get and look at ways of presenting it and say, well, what's useful? What do we have here? What what What, what is commemoration? And begin to try and answer some of those questions and I think I th yeah I think that with the particular example I gave was from remembering Sebenitska um yeah was it and that was that's one of the things that, that kind of questions that they're asking when they look at that data is you know what do people get out of these events what's the point of the event um <laughs> and I think yeah. it's a really important question to ask and so this is also to ask the question of not just what you're trying to do but also what are people who are coming to those events seeking to do and then engage with that because of course if you're getting upset about poppies then um, or the colour of the poppies there's something else that's going on which is is about the commemoration very specifically about the commemoration and perhaps not about the actual Absolutely. event itself and these these are both blurred and uh, different depending on who you're talking to. And this is perhaps one of the, the limitations with traditions right and ritual is that we repeat and we don't always stop and ask why why do mm. we wear poppy? Or you know, what do we still need to wear poppy? And we've got with the symbolic value and, and its reference to the poppy mm. fields, of course. But why? Why do we have to wear yeah. it? Why is it still? Could there be something else that could be just as powerful as the poppy? And COVID has kind of thrown up this idea that we couldn't all be in these spaces. And it, I mean, to think last year that you wouldn't have the 75th anniversary of the liberation at Auschwitz at Auschwitz would be absurd. Mm. But we didn't have you know, the crowds at Bergen Bells and we said, but we still did have it at the site in some ways there. And it's you know, this question of how much do we need to have these specific symbolic signifiers or is, you know, is there something else that is actually the crux of commemoration that can continue in different realms and different spaces? I mm. think is the important kind of question we're trying to interrogate. Yeah, that, that actually, in, in view of there are, no one's got their hand up just yet, so I, I, it kind of leads me on to my, my, my second question, um, which which is, is this question of perhaps how impactful has COVID been? You, you mentioned um, one project which was, was happening before, uh, before, well, obviously not before the pandemic started in, in, um, in Europe, but, but before, uh, if, sorry, in China, but before it kind of hit us, hit us here in Europe. Um, and I was just wondering, we've talked sort of before, particularly in relation to your previous work and then the work you did on your PhD about the question of visualisation and how representation 
um, is, is, is so integral to so many discussions about memory and, and, and in particular the, the, the Holocaust and the way in which some of the computer games you've looked at and, 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 mem and some of the, uh, the particularly the drawings and, and these, these sort of non-photographic artifacts have started to change the way in which people think about the question of, of, of representation. <laughs> And I suppose my question is, um, has has COVID and, and the pandemic and these kind of, has it accelerated um, some of these movements away from sort of fetish, fetishization of non-representation or fetishization of place? Um, has, has it accelerated those or, or did it begin those kind of, uh, you know, for, for lack of lack of options, you know, people were forced to do it in this way? So perhaps that's my question is how far is it an acceleration of forces that were already in play and how much is it really people had, had to do it and they didn't want to, but they, they, they did it because of the, the demands of, of the pandemic. I think um, I was fortunate with, with Mehdi and Oliver this morning to spend some time with their students who were brilliant and one of them wrote a very lovely thank you late on the Padlet I, I saw afterwards and I thought it was very cute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm made up by that. Um, and one of your students very astutely said, you know, that, that we talk about the, the Kristallnacht um, exhibition in Second Life um, now seems kind of archaic as, a, as an online platform. Mm. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum set that up. And um, one of your students, you know, astutely said that they just created what looks like a museum on the Internet. Why? Why did they bother? Mm. <laughs> well, you know, it's a really important point. And one of the things that happened with the pandemic was, um, museums kind of grappling with how to recreate what they do in person so the survivor talk and the live survivor talk the survivor zoom call the, the live um the facebook live um or the museum visit and what was really interesting is the museo de holocausto in argentina um was one of the last institutions to really um kind of think about what its digital agenda had to be it kind of stopped providing anything and then um, spent a lot of time in it, and, and it, it spent lots of time, so it had far more time to kind of think than these institutions that almost overnight opened up educational programs. Um, and it came up with a live museum tour. Um, after, I, think, I didn't think it started till September, so it was several months, and it, like, well, we can take people around the museum, literally. <laughs> like one of these virtual tours, like the Auschwitz panorama, where you kind of look at the site yourself, but actually have the museum guide still taking you around the museum space. Mm. Um, so in some ways, there's still this, and I think this is a big tradition in Holocaust memory that lots of institutions have struggled with, is the gatekeeping of that memory. Mm. And the gatekeeping of the historical narratives is really important because you know, the Holocaust distortion and denial is increasingly becoming more visible in online spaces. Um, but the, about the how to remember it, gatekeeping that can be quite mm. restricted because when, when young people do things like put selfies online, they get hounded by the press hounded by everyone sh publicly shamed and you know if that's your experience with holocaust memory publicly why would you bother mm, doing it yeah. again? so you kind of lose this these younger generations um but there has been some movement and i think covid has had massive impact on it the uc shower foundation is distinct in that they have very much had a media agenda since their formation it was funded by the prophets of schindler's lists and steven spielberg so it was always Kind of within Hollywood and now within the digital mm. humanities, they run digital humanity projects through survivor testimony. So they they are quite distinct as an organisation, but certainly in Europe and elsewhere, um, COVID has changed the way of thinking. An urgency has emerged um, to think with the digital. And I remember kind of paradoxically last last summer speaking in Amsterdam with lots of people, and I I said, you know, what, we, we don't think about the kind of blue sky questions do we what if next what if next year we had no electricity you know, you're thinking about digital projects at the moment what if we turn all the electricity off would it be a waste of money and funding and stuff to invest in digital the other way i wasn't thinking that in a year later we'd all only be <laughs> in the direction yeah. um, and a lot of the digital projects that were in development and, and exist are site specific and offline mm, so okay interactive biographies where you can talk to a holocaust survivor um they're only available in museums until they recently released this very um small scale one online but it's very small mm -hmm. scale compared to the, the others and the others are often ar apps where you can look at a site and look at it for your screen and look at the historical um geography that doesn't really work in the same way online and there is a big fear of what happens when you put stuff online that and it can circulate and, and yeah. be 
Yes. So your Shishara Foundation, have you, are you uh, experimenting with blockchain technology okay. to be able to track how people edit um, a, like a survivor video, for example, when that's circulating? Okay. okay. That's, so just on that point of the survivor, is, is the, I mean, that's fascinating <laughs> in any case, but is there, um, is there also uh, this idea of, you know, uh, few survivors still surviving and perhaps that's also, uh, like you're saying, with these, with museums wanting to incorporate videos and, and, and VR of survivors precisely because it's, it's not going to be that long before there are no survivors, uh, survivors left and, and that's not, nothing to do with uh, uh, the pandemic. Well, I think this is a, a again attention that you know the the idea that the digital somehow and even VHS before it and Betamax before it um, help us to retain and, and and keep and you know the digital loss is such a big issue in so many different levels from pixel loss to compression to you know having to move files around um, yeah you know, and file types disappearing and hard hardware not working anymore. There's lots of reasons why the digital is mm. not great for storing things long term. Yeah. Certainly, the, the need to record. I mean, this has been particularly driven since the early '90s, and, and Kate, who's here, could speak far better than me about VR survivor um, work. But the OC Show's project has been very much about taking survivors back to sites and recording them at sites, even as okay. um, archive material, new archive testimonies at sites in VR or 360, so that um, site memory sites can trigger memory um, in mm. the kind of last years of their life. I see. OK, uh, thanks. That's great. I see we've got one question. Mehdi, can I uh, please ask your question? Yeah, cheers. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Victoria, for, for the wonderful and rich presentation. Um, so I actually have two questions. I, I had many other questions, but I, you know, I made them boil down to do. <laughs> I'll ask my first question and then if there is no other question, I'll ask my second one. OK, OK, great. So yeah. uh, I, I, I loved how uh, how you uh, you related Aristotle's idea of form and tried to salvage a definition of, of, of commemoration that is not linked and limited to materiality, and that, that was really interesting. And that theoretical framework, it, it sounds really promising. So to me, one of the core questions, if not the core question that, that, that's part of your project and that links your project to other projects that, that of the like is, like, what, what does digital mediation do to the intensity of affect in your case that when you're talking about you, you, you of course you answered you answered it wonderfully and 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 I'd like to pick up the last sentence that you said it it's it spreads intensity across time and space I suppose that's what you said so that spreading does that mean that it in the process in the long run is that is that going to be thinning the the intensity of affect or are we going to end up like in 10 years, 20 years with with com commemoration that is so thin and spread across time that it's that, that it starts to lose the intensity or? I think that's a it's a brilliant question, really. And I, this was only I was thinking about, you know, when does it stop being intensity or is intensity just a different day? I get fascinated and well, go around in circles with words. I, I, or a lot of my research is about what does this word mean and <laughs> what can it mean? Um, and yeah, I mean, maybe but maybe that's an answer, right, for for memory like I have a a problem with anniversary events like the idea that there's only specific days that you should think about genocide or holocaust and you know the yeah. kind of uh, Tim Minchkin the Australian um, comedian talks about middle class guilt and he did a big um, <laughs> very offensive uh, song during a charity event about the fact that everyone was just there so they could pay some money and feel better about themselves and, and you know, tick the box. Oh, I gave some money to poor people to now I feel you know, good. Um, and, you know, sometimes anniversary events can feel a little bit like that, that. I've done my Holocaust Day. I've done my Roman Sinti Day. I've done this day. Aren't I good? Um, and, you know, does that mean, so in that case, is is that kind of the kind of big bang of intensity in, in a specific moment. You know, candle lighting often only takes two or three minutes. Is is that actually productive intensity, or mm -hmm. um, is actually having it spread through? If we're always kind of thinking about issues of of human rights, mm -hmm. and it's constantly in our minds because it's constantly visible, is is that kind of um, the saturation um, a form of intensity in itself? And I think you know if we think about media culture um and it's not just new with the digital but you know you used to go to train stations very very early on see adverts everywhere and that kind of intensity of information is that in itself um you know, perhaps more productive way of you know, spurring on memory oh, cheers. Really? perhaps uh, if you could hold on to your sure. second question for a moment yeah. maybe we've got another question from libby libby please 
go for it. Hi, I'm I'm really happy for Mehdi, Mehdi for you to ask another one if you want or, or <laughs> if okay no, go go ahead go ahead Libby go ahead <laughs> okay um Vicky thank you very much for the fascinating paper and um, thank you for that um I had a I have a question um really about I guess your choice to focus on the um, commemoration relating to the Second World War and the Holocaust and I guess my question would be um, to what extent does the digital open up possibilities for rethinking which events we commemorate and which events we don't commemorate and I'm thinking there so I guess in relation to the extent to which the digital allows for a continuation of existing um, events that we commemorate such as in the UK as you, you um, explained the liberation of Bergen-Belsen um, in relation to the Holocaust there are other events that we might commemorate as well which we don't commemorate and sometimes there are events that have to do with or that don't have such clear relationships to particular sites or, or places so I'm thinking about Holocaust sites where everything has disappeared for example but we might also think about events that have to do with um, or the history of colonialism for example um, so I was interested in the way that you're um, you're also hoping to work with or working with people um, uh, commemorating a range of different events Absolutely. Thank you, Libby. Brilliant question. And thank you so much for coming. It's so nice to see you. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think this is really important. And, and maybe this is, you know, again, the idea of event and the idea of events is ongoing. I and mean, when we talk about the Holocaust, it's often referred to as a historic event, but you know, it's not a day, it's not a, even a year. It's, it's a very complicated set of his, you know, political and social things that happen between really the early 30s, 40s, but also the displaced person camps and everything else after afterwards. Um, and you know, there's perhaps a really interesting way or scope for using network communication to think about um, issues around migration and displacement, and and remembering refugees um, and multiple histories of refugees and movements of refugees. I've been talking recently with some people about Holocaust survivor testimony and how that um, sometimes endangers the kind of um, the true life story of these individuals that they become Holocaust survivors and not, you know, award-winning musicians or whatever they're builders or hairdressers or whatever job they've or career they've gone on to. And you know, many survivors of genocide have gone on to have a huge impact in the cultures that they they then move to live into as refugees. And that's not commemorated in the same way that the thing that happened to them is. Um, but and they. One of the things that we really want to do with this archive is, is think about ways that you can link up um, what commemoration is and, and the limitations and possibilities in some places over others. And I think digital connectivity and the digital divide have become really, really apparent during COVID that some countries um, did their education by television or radio because there isn't the substantial digital connectivity. Other countries assumed like the UK, that are you know young people, for example, have digital uh, access at home, and many many don't. Um, but with the, so with the project, like the two, to me, kind of new areas, um, and that I think are particularly um, powerful, are looking specifically at the Bubassin Memorial. So the South African Genocide and so Holocaust and Genocide Foundation um, have, as with it many Holocaust and genocide organizations looked at lots and lots of commemorative events last year. But we wanted to focus specifically on that because it was a year uh, that I can't remember this specific dignitary like the UK High Commission or something um, actually apologized for the uh, detainment camp. And that this actually links the Holocaust within colonial narratives that we often forget that many Jews fled Europe into colonial co colonized spaces um, where you know, the really complicated dynamics are going on around race, ethnicity, power, Europe and, 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 and the colonised space. Um, we had the, you know, the Shanghai ghetto as well. We had the kind of um, US dominance in, in, in the Philippines and, and the kind of um, the movement of both perpetrators and um, Jewish refugees to South America, particularly Argentina. And that these are uh, there's lots of work going on at the moment around decolonizing um, the Holocaust and lots of people when this was first kind of mentioned in 
spa- research spaces I was in, at least, they were like, we don't need to de-holoc- you know, decolonize the Holocaust. It's already about power relationships. And say, like, no, because we're still, you know, it's, people thought it was absurd to decentralize Europe from the Holocaust because, you know, it was orchestrated by you know, Nazi Germany and their um, allies. And, it, you know, the death camps were specifically uh, Nazi occupied Poland. Um, and then you know, the killing grounds in the, in the east as well. But there is there is this really huge history that uh, links it within um, colonial dynamics, post-war and pre-war as well, that I think is op- are opened up by looking at Bubasan as a, as a case study, but also looking at with the Rwandan project. Um, we really specifically want to look at how Rwandan diaspora in Belgium and England, uh, or the UK more widely rather, um, remember that because there's a lot of tension between how the Rwanda, the genocide against the Tutsis is reman- remembered officially within Rwanda and how it is remembered by those communities who have not returned to Rwanda. Um, and again, these politics, this, these power politics about state commemorations versus community commemorations, the kind of grassroots victims, um, survivor groups um, versus how states tell us to commemorate, I think are are really important with that part of the the archive project, and that's what we're hoping to pull out. And I think um, with Belton and New Gammon, you, you know, you still have this kind of slight state connection between the sites um, and a national idea of memory. And um, I think, yeah, you, you put on a really you know important point that I think commemoration events are often top down. They are often national, or at least kind of commu- to the top of a community down to their wider community. And there are lots of events, and we did a. Um, a quick bit of kind of network analysis uh, or network visualization around VE Day. And what was really interesting just by using that hashtag and putting it through Python um, and using Kumo, which is a free platform online, we could see the peripheral tweets that weren't connected to all the others. There was these two at the end, which was just a local commemoration for, I don't know, there was, there was a, a three or four men who had been involved um, in, in one very particular event. And it was the village's... Um, commemoration of this particular group and it wasn't connected to the imperial war museum or the bbc it wasn't part of the kind of bizarre 1940s fancy dress thing that was encouraged for some reason about VE day which i didn't really understand um it was complete and they, they had their own little symbols and their own little pictures and it you wouldn't have noticed it if you hadn't have kind of had a look at the whole network of how this hashtag was moving around so i'd like it if we can draw those things into the center and like flip the peripheral and the central and start thinking about how local communities and local groups and, and, and dispersed groups remember these things that have a particular kind of um, hegemonic narrative really in terms of how they should be remembered. Thanks very much for that for that question Libby and, and for your response Vicky. Uh, before we go back for a second question we've got about 15 minutes left. Does, would, can, I, can I invite anyone else to, to ask a question? Um, if not, Mehdi, the floor is yours for, a, for, for your second question. All right, I'm back. <laughs> uh, I was just curious, Vicky, have you encountered any similar patterns with, uh, with the Armenian genocide commemoration in your work? In- it's not a case I've looked at, actually, and yeah. I want to, and I've not found. So, so I've... <laughs> My my research interest was was a Holocaust. I started looking at Srebrenica and the petitioning in India of India actually is uh, for for the memorial in the Digital Age yeah. book. Um, and I have a friend who's working in Rwanda who was kind of talking about kind of hopefully being involved in the project as well. But the Armenian genocide is not an area in terms of commemoration events that I've looked at, and it would okay. be really fascinating. In, the reason I'm asking is you you mentioned diaspora a few times and with the Jewish diaspora, so you know. I, with with Armenia, the question of diaspora is is really important as well. So I I thought maybe I mean it would be really interesting to look at how that works with uh, like commemoration. I think it's April twenty fourth, and I think this it it was during the and it happened in France if I remember correctly. And the, we were in lockdown in that period in France. So that would be really interesting to look at like in, in terms of whether you have similar patterns or not. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's brilliant. And I remember completely anecdotally a few years ago, um, yeah, was, what's the, it would, it would have been for the 100th year anniversary, um, Sergi from System of a Down, uh, yeah. he's, an, he's Armenian, sure. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. um, he wanted to do a charity event to raise awareness for yeah. the Armenian genocide in London. And this is yeah. a kind of 
the problem of the, of the digital intervening with, with, with in-person events, it was like for, for just a small number of people, like a thousand people or something, and he put it in London and all the tickets sold out in um, in minutes or seconds because ticket, um, you know, ticket scraping software had been used to grab the tickets and sell them for extortionate prices online. So you have this um, kind of hijacking of which, what would have been a kind of musical memorial event. And he's very deeply uh, passionate and a big advocate yeah. for um commemorating that genocide and yeah it was a huge and I think it's a really important genocide to look at because both with Bosnia as well you hear the language in International Holocaust Memorial Day where people talk about the atrocities in Armenia and mm. they talk about the massacre at Srebrenica and they don't say the Armenian genocide yeah. and the Bosnian genocide mm. um yeah so I think that I'm gonna have a look at that now 24th of April <laughs> thank you thank you thank you Victoria thanks very much for that Mehdi um if there are no other questions, I've got uh, perhaps chair's prerogative. I've got another question um, that, that I, I'd quite like to ask you. Um, uh, no, I, OK, I'll, I'll dive right in there again. Then I, I was I was quite interested um, in the concerns that were being voiced. I, I don't know exactly by whom, uh, but you, you, you talked to the beginning about you know people being very concerned about the con certain consequences of going online about um, particularly about this question of participation what how does that uh, lead does that lead to rewriting of history particularly in relation to say uh, Holocaust deniers and and, and 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 whatnot and and also these concerns about what would happen when things go on to new media when when things go online like what what are the consequences of that? Um, often with the, the same old prejudices that are, are linked to new media um, coming out in, in different ways and, and, and uh, diff different kind of forms. But I, I was I was wondering how whether whether there were any specific like um, examples which uh, either refuted or or, or or sort of proved that these these concerns were 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 appropriate or were were were, were grounded in 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 how would we put it were, were legitimate and, and that these concerns were going to be realized you know I, I i was thinking you know recently with the sort of the 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 the, the capital storming um in in the us you know with, with these very openly anti-semitic t-shirts uh, and then the uh, the neo-nazi tattoos and things and there's this huge discussion about how oh right wow you know these 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 sort of concerns about which sort of woolly voiced concerns about uh, far right and uh, and, and anti-semitic tropes and whatnot suddenly like oh yeah this this is a really big deal um how how did how has that worked out in relation to commemoration and, and the Holocaust? Have there been serious problems with far right activists or anti-Semitic uh, activists or, or uh, anti-Semitic trolls or um, Holocaust deniers? Or is it more of a kind of academic concern that has been uh, that has allowed these 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 concerns to be allayed? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a it's a real concern, um, and it's an increasingly visible concern. I think there's been a lot of celebration, and I, I wrote a blog about this just at the beginning of the year. Um, a lot of celebration about particular social media platforms, you know, t telling the world that they have you know suppressed anti-Semitic or far right or Holocaust denial content on their pages, uh, their platforms. They've they've rarely, if ever, actually gone out and deleted it all. They've often just found ways to hide it in searches and make it harder to find things. Um, what I find perhaps is missing from the conversation really is the Holocaust denial and Holocaust distortion are are real and difficult. But what I think the capital, uh, some of the images from the capital uh, riots really drew attention to is that a lot of the people know the Holocaust happened. They just don't think it was successful enough. And that that's the really, really, really worrying thing. It's not denial. They, they've learned about the Holocaust and think it could have been done better. And we see that in two of the images from the Capitol riots was the T-shirt that said Auschwitz camp staff. And one that said um, uh, 6MNE, which is 6 million was not, or WNE, 6 million was not enough. That's, a, that's the area that I don't think we are concentrating on enough. That is, uh, it's not just anti-Semitism. It is a... Um, kind of an outright suggestion that the Holocaust needs to continue, um, not denying it or distorting it. And, and OK, maybe we can consider that a form of Holocaust distortion, but I think it's actually needs, we need to focus on that in its, as a phenomenon in its own right, because I think that is significantly mm. more dangerous. It's call for genocide. Mm. Um, and Holocaust, yeah, Holocaust and I was 
was dangerous and perhaps has led to some of this. But I think also Holocaust education has led to some of this, right? If people know um, about Auschwitz and know about uh, six million Jews and now have taken that ideology, that's worrying. Um, yeah. And I think well, in terms of um, how it's been visible in examples is that some of the events were Zoom bombed by um, far right um, people um, mm. this year. That's okay. it. And some of the research around um, YouTube comments, you know, so some of the early kind of academic research in this area has been, you know, well, you know, is it useful to stick, stick a Holocaust video on YouTube? What happens in the conversations? And it's a lot of trolling. It's mm. a lot of denial, distortion. Not all of that is always intended to be denial. And, and this is something I, I, I wrote about recently was that, you know, we need to not fear the technology. And you mentioned that, Oliver, but actually the culture and one of the kind of cultures of a lot of these social media platforms is trolling is trying to get the most likes or get voted up by being offensive mm. for the sake of being offensive and the holocaust is the tool for the ultimate offense um and we need to change that culture otherwise we're never going to decrease that visibility you know, mm. banning people from twitter or facebook is not enough there's a, there's a culture that's much more insidious than that yeah, and perhaps to a finish on a, I don't know, hopefully slightly <laughs> positive note, or, or, or perhaps you know, rather than just uh, the critical note, what what do you see uh, the work that you do and the different uh, networks you're part of, and you know, you mentioned a number of different projects today. Um, a very big question, but you know, what what do you see that the, that they can do in in order to uh, deal with 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 these issues. Um, how can they help to reduce uh, or at least fight back in some way against um, many of these problems that you've just uh, so uh, so so nicely summarised? I think the kind of main drive or impetus behind the stuff that I'm doing is trying to bring siloed groups together. The I don't think there is enough understanding of digital cultures and media culture and media studies in um holocaust heritage and education um and i think that means that heritage institutions end up making kind of assumptions about the digital without really having that criti critical expertise or they, they might have the they bring in computer scientists with the technological expertise who love it and, and are big advocates for the tech but not without the critical side mm -hmm. but also you know, that they there's a lot to be learned for example from some of the youtube influencers who do video you know, videos of their trips to Auschwitz and get you know, millions of people watching them about how they use digital culture. They might, their, their content may not be that appropriate, but what if they sat down in a room with a Holocaust organization and the Holocaust education got to share some you know, stuff about Holocaust history with them and they got mm. to share their knowledge about how to you know, use YouTube to you know, cultivate engagement. I think you know, a lot of these, breaking down some of the walls and the silos would, would help um, have a much more productive um kind of holocaust memory going forward in the in the digital anyway particularly well i think that's uh, perhaps a, a nice way to, to to finish today um so um i hope everyone will, will join me it's a bit difficult to, to to have any kind of applause or anything but i hope you everyone uh, who's watching will uh, join me in thanking uh, vicky for a, a fascinating talk um thank you to everyone for coming um, it's really great to um, to have so many people here um, uh, on at the end of an afternoon, um, despite so many things uh, going on. So thank you very much for those of you that, that signed up to be on the mailing list. Uh, you'll get some some information soon about a further event we've got planned in a couple of months um, and and further events uh, beyond that. But once again, thank you very much to, to, to Vicky. Thank you to everyone for coming and, and, and have a lovely evening. Thank you, thank Oliver, you. for organising thank this. You. Emily. Thank My you very pleasure. Much. Thanks thank a lot. A lovely meeting you, Vicky. Thank you very you much. You too. Thank yeah. you. Th thank you all.